Dr. Comis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Ryan Gumper. Ryan got his PhD in biochemistry and biophysics from Georgia State University, and he's currently a postdoc in Brian Roth's lab at the University of North Carolina. I previously talked to Dr. Roth in an early episode of the podcast, and today I talked to his postdoc, Ryan, about some of the work that they're doing in the lab today. Ryan studies a variety of things related to serotonin receptors and the action of psychedelics. He studies things at the small level, at the level of atoms and molecules, at the level of biochemistry and the structure of proteins. So we went over some of the basics of brain receptors. What are they? What is the difference between a GPCR and an ion channel? What are those things? We spent a lot of time talking about serotonin receptors, especially the 5-HT2A receptor, which is the so-called psychedelic receptor in the brain, which is, it does many things naturally in the brain and in the body, but it's the receptor that seems to be required for the psychedelic effects of things like LSD or DMT or psilocybin. And so we got into some detail around how those interactions work. What happens when serotonin or one of these tryptamine psychedelics bind to that receptor? What kind of signaling pathways and effects on proteins and stuff inside the cell are triggered by different drugs binding to that receptor? And so, you know, if you already know the basics about psychedelics and the serotonin 2A receptor, and you want to learn a little bit more about the details, all of the gory details at the molecular level, but how these, how these things work and how that is all related to the quest in Brian Roth's lab and in other labs to find and create new drugs that might have therapeutic benefits but don't have psychedelic effects, or to create new drugs that have uh, more specificity, that bind to only one or a small number of receptors rather than many receptors, as a lot of the classic psychedelics do, then then this will be a good podcast for you. It'll really give you a, a general sense for what we know about the details of these molecular interactions and the implications for understanding that for the development of new psychedelics and psychedelic-derived compounds. As always, if you enjoy the content I'm producing, please like, share, and subscribe. Don't forget to check out the Mind and Matter Substack at Mind and matter.substack.com. You'll find my long-form writing, all the episodes of the podcast, and have access to my free weekly newsletter, which includes podcast updates, weekly research roundups, and other interesting things I'm reading and looking at related to the topics I cover on the podcast. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per Per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mind and matter, athletic greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure. And vitamin D is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup. I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash mindedmatter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. And with that, here's my conversation with Dr. Ryan Gumper. Two and a half years now. Um, started my official start date was May 2020, so right in the middle of the pandemic. Oh wow! Um, I couldn't actually get into the lab until I think it was mid June or so. Um, so we started working in shifts, um, and then yeah, just you know hit the ground running with a lot of the research that we've been doing. Yeah. So I mean, can you just explain what your what your PhD was in and like what kind of scientist you are and what what level you're thinking things at? Sure. Yeah. So um, my PhD was in actually uh, doing research on viruses. So molecular virology, uh, structural biology of those viruses. I did a lot of work on 
class of viruses called negative stranded RNA viruses. So if you think of like, um, you know, SARS-CoV-2, that's positive stranded RNA virus. This is the opposite strand of that. So instead of using their genome to directly kind of translate proteins, um, uh, for that, the negative stranded RNA viruses actually have to make the mRNA transcripts from their genome, which then gets translated to, to proteins during the replication process. So a lot of my focus was on the structural proteins that surround the genome and then trying to find uh, various, you know, small molecules that would interact with this and potentially block uh, the uh, transcription process of that. And these are viruses you hear, everyone's heard of, you know, like flu, um, Ebola, uh, you know, those types of viruses. So, so how'd you get into Brian Roth's lab? Is that tied to your focus yeah, on so structural biology and, and the biophysics of this? Yes. Yeah, kind of exactly. So actually, so my interest in psychedelics kind of goes all the way back to when I was uh, finishing. So I actually have two degrees in undergrad. One was in music. Um, and then the other one uh, was obviously in chemistry. Um, but nearing the end of my music degree, I got, I read Shulgin's book and uh, PCAL and um, got really interested in kind of just overall chemistry, science behind things. And my initial thought was to try and go to med school. Um, but then I learned, you know, I could actually get a PhD in chemistry doing like structural biology type stuff uh, within that. And I went the route to go get my PhD then. Um, then after my PhD, um, I had taught myself like how to code and do a bunch of AI and data science type of stuff uh, during my PhD to, to do some of my research. So I actually worked as a data scientist a little bit, but didn't really feel myself fitting in with that more kind of, um, you know, corporate type of workspace. Um, and out of the blue, I was just like, you know, I really want to try and study psychedelics. Um, I know about Brian's lab from his work on solving the uh, 5-HT2B LSD crystal structure. And I just reached out to Brian and he was happened to be looking for structural biologists uh, to work on them. So that's kind of how I got into Brian's lab. Interesting. So what are you working on in Brian's lab? And can, so can you talk about what you're working on in particular and then just sort of get, maybe give people some context as to what the lab does in general? Sure. Um, so what I'm working on in particular is um, the 5-HT2A receptor. I work on our large uh, DARPA grant uh, project that we have that's working with multiple institutions. Uh, the whole idea of that uh, project is to come up with uh, non-psychedelic psychedelics. So agonists that hit the 5-HT2A receptor, but don't necessarily cause hallucinations. Um, um, and that's kind of the whole premise of that grant. Um, I also work on the 5-HT2C receptor. And within this, I'm very interested in the structural biology. So how all of these molecules interact with the receptor and how those interactions interplay with the functional downstream effects uh, of those receptors. I see. So, so that's, that's kind of my overarching kind of thing. I also mix in a lot of like computational stuff. Uh, with that as well. So MD simulations, um, um, more AI machine learning stuff as well. So, you know, for everyone listening, this will probably not be the best episode if you are wanting to just start to learn about psychedelics and the underlying biology. This one might be more appropriate for someone who already knows that and really wants to go into more detail on the small stuff, meaning literally the small stuff, the molecular biology and the biophysics of like what is happening when classical psychedelics are doing what they do inside of uh, the brain. Um, but nonetheless, let, let's build a, a reasonable base for people here. So we've already started talking about 5-HT stuff and, uh, and, and some detail. And we're going to elaborate all of that, but let's just let's just start out with some some pretty basic stuff here. So, what are brain receptors, and can you sort of maybe compare and contrast the the ion channels versus the uh, the metabotropic type receptors? Yeah, sure. So um, there are a couple. The there are obviously like ion channels and then receptors, which which they're all like GPCRs or G protein coupled receptors. Um, so ion channels kind of is exactly what you call it. They are a channel that um, selectively allows permeation of various different types of ions through. So you can think of sodium ions, potassium ions, calcium ions. 
And these can both be like voltage gated, meaning there is a charge difference between the inside and the outside of the membrane. And then that allows the channel to selectively start to open or close to allow various ions through or ligand gated, um, which there is some sort of ligand that binds to the outside of the cell of the membrane, which then activates or allosterically, you know, modulates um, the, the channel to actually allow the permeability then of the ions through the membrane. Um, so the distinction between that and GPCRs, so GPCRs actually don't let anything through. They act as a signal transduction um, modulator, essentially. So you have a ligand that would come in and bind, which then stabilizes an active conformation of the receptor, which then causes a signal transduction cascade through that. And these can be various different things. Um, there are multiple ones. There are excitatory ones and also inhibitory ones. Um, that do that. And then there's also things that work directly more on transcription. I see. So for neurons to do what they do, it's it's all about how charged up they are or not. That determines yep, whether or exactly. not they fire a signal. So you've got ion channels where you have ions like sodium or potassium and or other ions that literally physically flow through the channel, just like water flowing through a, a channel in our macroscopic life. And that determines how charged up the neuron is. But then there's these other types of receptors, and that includes things like GPCRs. And mm -hmm. there's nothing flowing through them, but something like a drug or, or some endogenous compound in the body binds to them. And then that on the outside of the cell, and then on the inside of the cell, stuff happens uh, based on how everything is sort of hooked up. Yep. Which in some cases, they activate ion channels, they'll inactivate ion channels. It depends on cell type, receptor type, things like that. So it's a, it's a very complicated process and there's a lot going on, um, but it's all kind of intertwined with each other as well. Mm -hmm. And so you've already mentioned, you know, you work on the 5-HG2A receptor, other 5-HT receptors. These are serotonin receptors. How many serotonin receptors are there and, and which of these types are they? So there are seven different serotonin receptors. Um, Six of them are GPCRs. Um, one is actually a ligand-gated ion channel. So 5-HT3 is a ligand-gated ion channel. Um, so there is the 5-HT1 and 5-HT5, and there are various subtypes of those, but they are mostly um, signaling through GI, which is an inhibitory pathway. Um, there is the 5-HT2 family, uh, which um, for our cases in psychedelics, there, there, a lot of them bind to them and, and interact with them, the 2A, 2B, and 2C receptors, and they all signal through an excitatory GQ pathway. And then um, 5-HT4, 6, and 7, they primarily signal through GS pathway, which is also excitatory. Um, and, you know, these are found you know, scattered throughout the brain and actually the whole body, um, all these different serotonin receptors, um, you know, expressed in different regions, expressed in different areas, different subtypes as well. So, and so is it, um, is this typical? So if you have a neuromodulator, say like serotonin or dopamine or acetylcholine or whatever, is, the, is it normal that you would have several different types of receptors in the brain that one would bind to, or are there typically more, are there typically less? So, I, Craig, I don't know about that particularly, but I think serotonin is actually the most complex out of all of them. They have the most different types. I do know the dopamine receptors have a, a bunch of different types. There's also a bunch of like different opioid receptors as well. Um, but I think off the top of my head, serotonin may have the most different receptors um, in kind of the overarching family. And then if you drill down in the different subtypes, definitely even more than that. Like I think 5-HT1 has five different subtypes um, within that. So there's 5 HT one a B, D, and E. I see. Um, so you, you could almost imagine like a family, like, and it would be basically a literal family tree here where you've got yep. 5 HD one receptors, two receptors, three receptors, but then branching yep. underneath each of those branches, you've got multiple type one receptors, multiple type two receptors, and so on and so yep. forth. Yep, exactly. And where do all these things come from in an evolutionary sense? Are they come? Are, are there uh, you know genes that encode these receptors, and they've been sort of duplicated and mutated and changed over time? Uh, yeah, so um, they're pretty ubiquitous, I think, throughout more complex organisms. Um, 
we, um, yeah, they're, they're ubiquitous throughout uh, most of the organisms, uh, more complex organisms. They, um, so throughout mammals, it's actually relatively conserved. I know for the 5-HT2A receptor, there are various mutations though that, um, that occur. Maybe we can get into that um, and how that affects psychedelic studies in particular. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, it's well conserved throughout most of the, you know, more complex animal kingdom. Yeah. And um, one more very basic question to ground people, you know, we're talking about serotonin receptors, but we keep saying 5-HT2, 5-HT1. Yes. What is the 5-HT yeah. part of this and why is that serotonin? So 5-HT is the actual, it's an abbreviation for the actual chemical name, 5-hydroxytryptamine. Um, so you can think of, if you want to, can kind of explain it. You have one six-membered ring joined by a five-membered ring kind of together. Um, and there's a nitrogen at the point of the pentagon on the five-membered ring. And off of that, you have a tail with another, a carbon tail with another nitrogen on it. And at the five position on the six-membered ring is a hydroxyl group, so an OH group. Um, and that's what I call it, 5-hydroxytryptamine. Um, and there are various, you know, uh, a lot of psychedelics are in the tryptamine class. So they all have this tryptamine core, which is that two membered ring system with the tail. Um, and then there are various substituents off of that. So when I you hear 5 HP, serotonin, or 5 hydroxytryptamine. I see. So tryptamines is a chemical class. You've basically got a pentagon stapled to a hexagon. Yep. There's some nitrogens in there. And, yep. um, and then there's sort of variations on that basic core that give you the difference between serotonin or DMT or psilocin and so forth. Yep, yep, exactly. Okay. And so these receptors, so when we talk about the 5 hd 2 a receptor, as, as we will quite a bit today, this is the so-called psychedelic receptor. It's the one that classical psychedelics bind to. It's obviously also a serotonin receptor. You know, before we get into the psychedelics, how selective are these um, ligand-gated receptors and GPCRs. So, you know, endogenously is, is serotonin like the only thing that binds to them? Is there other stuff that binds to them? Um, endogenously, I think serotonin is really the only thing that binds to them. Um, now when you are talking about, you know, other psychedelic drugs, um, there are a lot that will bind to other types of receptors. I see. Um, there, a lot of them are fairly, I guess you can call them non-specific or dirty drugs. Um, you know, LSD will bind to not only all of the serotonin uh, receptors, but there's evidence that it binds to, you know, the dopamine receptors as well. Um, so there's, they're, they're very promiscuous in that sense and bind to other receptors in the brain um, mediating their actions. I see. So the serotonin receptors themselves, relatively selective for serotonin in terms of their natural ligands. Um, but the tryptamine psychedelics tend to bind to multiple serotonin receptors, including 5-HG2A, as well as other receptors. And, you know, the exact mix of things they bind to just depends on the drug. Depends on the drug. Yep. Depends on the substituents. Um, yeah. Uh, you have, so I guess we can go into like, there's, there's three different types of, I think three classifications of psychedelics. You can kind of put them into these three different families. We've already talked about the tryptamines, which closely resemble serotonin. Kind of underneath that, you can think of ergolines, which is a more rigidified tryptamine that has extra ring systems on it. And this is a drug like LSD. Um, so there's a whole class of LSD-like drugs which have a tryptamine core that kind of come out of that based on those substituents. Um, and then you have um, phenethylamines, which are actually most closely remember, uh, resemble dopamine. Um, mm. But these are... Um, substituted they are a uh, six member ring and they usually have various oxygens on it and but there's still that at that tail and then there's a free amine or a nitrogen at the end of it um so a lot of these compounds will activate a lot of what they're called the aminergic type receptors because of this free amine there um, and they interact all within a very similar manner um in that sense what would be um, an example what are some examples of phenethylamines so you can think of mescaline. Um, that's kind of the, the classic psychedelic phenethylamine. Um, yeah, yeah, that's kind of the classic one. MDMA would be a type of a phenethylamine as well, um, although that doesn't doesn't hit any of the serotonin receptors really too much. Um, it's quite weak in that sense. Um, 
but yeah. Okay. Um, so in terms of 5-HT2A, the serotonin 2A receptor, the one that is famous for being activated and responsible for the psychoactive, the psychedelic effects of psychedelics, walk us through, you know, start to walk us through what happens when, let's just start with serotonin. Serotonin mm-hmm. binds to this receptor. What exactly happens to make stuff happen, to make a cell do something after that happens? Sure. So these receptors are interesting. So be, they, so kind of let me back up here. So a lot of proteins, when you draw them in like these scientific figures, they're normally drawn as like blobs or just like a big blob or a cartoon, or sometimes you'll see like transmembrane helices kind of coming through. Um, and a lot of people may think of them as just these static entities. Um, they're really not. So with the serotonin receptors and GPCR receptors in general, they're actually constantly moving and they're switching between different states. Um, so what there are, there are multiple different states within these receptors. You can think of like an inactive state to an active state transition. Now these molecules, when they bind to the receptor, they will stabilize one specific state of that receptor. In this case, serotonin will stabilize an active state um, which causes a conf- which is in a conformational state of the GPCR that allows the transducer, in this case for the 5-HT2A receptor, 5-HT family, is a G alpha Q beta gamma heterotrimer. And then once that heterotrimer binds to the, the intracellular side of the receptor, there is um, an exchange of GDB for GTP. Um, and this then causes um, the alpha, the G alpha, beta, and gamma to dissociate from each other and move away from the receptor and then go through their downstream signaling uh, occurrences here. Um, G alpha Q then will go and uh, activate uh, a PLC, which then cleaves uh, uh, PIP2 into its constitutive parts of you know, DAG and IP3 or diacylglycerol um, and IP3. Um, that then goes to and in, release intracellular calcium stores and you get calcium signaling that you can actually um, see. And then there's other PKC um, that gets activated as well. Um, and that is responsible then for all of the myriad of effects of protein kinase C that happens uh, then throughout the cell. I see. So, so there's multiple steps that happen here. So you've got a receptor, the serotonin 2A receptor. It's a GPCR, which means it's not an ion channel. So it's not opening and closing to let electricity basically flow through it. It is able to have a drug or an endogenous compound like serotonin bind to it on the outside of the cell, but it is, uh, it is going through the cell membrane itself. And on the other side, on the inside, it's hooked up to some protein machinery and yep. whether or not it's bound by serotonin or a drug or something determines whether that machinery is just sort of like sitting there idly on the inside stuck to the, the other end of this receptor or it gets activated and then goes on to do other things in the cell. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, essentially that's what happens. Um, so actually in these States um, the ligand binds first to the receptor, which actually primes it, for that machinery to then actually come in and bind to the receptor itself as well. I so see. there's a, a myriad of like protein, protein interactions happening. Then uh, once there's activation occurring, then there's an exchange that occurs, which gives energy for then the dissociation and conformational changes in those proteins to move the, towards their down, other downstream signaling effects. I see. So instead of thinking of the receptor as, you know, just receiving signals from the outside of the cell, it's, it's really receiving signals from both. And when those sort of line up in the right way, then interesting stuff happens. Happens. Yep. Yep. I see. So, okay. So, so receptor is bound on the outside by serotonin. Receptor is uh, interacting on the inside with these interesting proteins and they get activated um, through, through various biochemical mechanisms. And then some other stuff started to happen. Um, what Walk us through the, the fairly basics of that other stuff. And then talk about like, what is the end goal if we anthropomorphize here? Like what, what, is, uh, what is the end result of this that the cell is, is trying to achieve? Yeah. So um, 
So once it binds to those, I, I think we were talking about this before. So we have this G, Q, beta, gamma, heterotrimer. These things dissociate from each other. Um, and that GQ then will go and interact with another membrane bound protein called PLC. Um, and this is a, a phospholipase. So uh, this will go then and cleave the, um, I don't know if it's a fatty acid, but it's PIP, PIP2. Um, and that's, it's, yeah, it's essentially a fatty acid. So it has a sugar group on top and a long diacylglycerol fatty uh, uh, chain on the bottom, which is just a bunch of carbons uh, you can think of down in a row. Um, and this then clears it into a constitutive parts into diacylglycerol and IP3. So IP3 is a, a it's a sugar essentially with uh, three phosphate groups on it. And then that will go in IP3, will go and activate various uh, calcium channels to release um, endogen endogenous intracellular calcium that's kind of stored up within the cell. Um, and then diacylglycerol will go and uh, activate uh, PKC as well as the calcium will activate uh, protein kinase C. Um, and that will then go and phosphorylate a lot of various things, other calcium channels within the cell um, and other downstream effectors. Now, the ultimate uh, goal of this uh, would be the second messenger signal, uh, which is calcium. Um, and that um, acts as excitatory for neurons. So that increases their firing rates. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately also those other phosphorylation and um, stuff and a lot with a lot of these drugs, which you're finding out is their therapeutic effect actually leads to um, formation of spines or spinogenesis uh, on the neurons. So you can think of, you have more interactions and networks within these uh, mm -hmm. neurons themselves. Okay. So let's break this down a little bit. So serotonin or psychedelic binds to the 5-HD2A receptor, this GPCR. Proteins sort of hooked up to the other side of that receptor on the inside of the cell become activated a bunch of biochemistry happens with the prime sort of primary result being calcium gets released from the inside of the cell, which also is connected to calcium maybe coming inside the cell through an ion channel. And calcium is super important, right? Like I think the average person thinks yep. of calcium, they think of their bones or something, but it's, it's very important for this kind of process in neurons. And it can activate different proteins inside of the cell that, that do certain things. And it has the sort of excitatory yep. effect on the cell. And then so you said spinogenesis, but let's connect the dots here between calcium increasing within the cell after the GPCR is activated and then stuff happening maybe in the nucleus of the cell. Yeah, so um, there are various transcription factors and such that get activated from this uh, uh, signaling cascade, which then lead to the formation you know, of new structures and spines within that. I see. So, so when people hear about something like psychedelics causing neuroplasticity or causing new connections to form, this is what you mean by spines. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And so, and so, literally, you know, compound binds to receptor, proteins get activated inside the cell, calcium goes up; it gets more concentrated inside the cell, and among other things, uh, different genes get turned on such as those that encode proteins that will actually be used to physically build new connections. Yep, exactly. Um, and that's, that's only, so that's actually, that's like one side of the signaling pathway of these receptors. There are a couple of other signaling pathways um, uh, that actually occur as well. Um, but this is kind of where you hear a lot about the therapeutic effect of psychedelics, um, their antidepressant effects why a lot of people are, are thinking about it in this way. Mm -hmm. um, they also couple to another protein called arrestin, um, um, which uh, goes and that also has various signal transduction pathways as well. Um, and then um, another one that is a potential complex is uh, PSD95 or postsynaptic post density protein 95. Um, that is also known to interact with the 5-HT2 a receptor in particular mm -hmm. when it comes to psychedelics. Um, but yeah, a lot, a lot needs to be studied about how, how these different signaling pathways, whether they lead to hallucinations, whether they lead to therapeutic effects or not. Yeah. And so, you know, so we sort of sketched out for people 
one of the pathways that can be linked to 5-HG2A receptor activation. This is the G protein complex and, and the calcium effects and, and the stuff we were talking about. But now you're saying that there's these other protein complexes that can also be hooked up and attached to this receptor on the inside of the cell. It, it, so if you've got a cell, like a neuron in the brain, just we'll think about one neuron. Um, is it if the, is the 5-HG2A receptor that that cell has, the, the many of them that are in the membrane of that cell, are all of them going to be hooked up to the G proteins or some to the G proteins, some to arrest it and this other thing? Or how do we think about that? So how we think about that is um, the G protein side, when the receptor is activated, is actually happening over and over again. Mm -hmm. This is where you get the signal amplification. Um, now, at some point, um, the receptor will get phosphorylated. Mm -hmm. um, itself. Um, and this usually happens, you know, from various other kinases, GRKs, uh, things like that. Um, and then once it's phosphorylated, the canonical point of view that kind of turns off the receptor is something called arrestin. And you can think of arrestin because it's causing Arresting. arrestin, yeah. the signaling. Yeah. Um, and uh, in particular with the 5-HT2A receptor, um, these are then thought to then cause um, actual internalization of the receptor. So the receptor will then get brought in from the membrane itself. So it's no longer there. Um, it can no longer signal. So I it see. actually like turns off the receptor and stops. The signal I see. So itself. instead of, instead of maybe thinking about these as completely and utterly distinct serotonin to a receptor protein complexes, it's almost like, uh, it's like multiple degrees of, uh, of regulation. So, yep. you know, sort of typically you first think about the receptor getting activated and doing the G protein stuff that we talked about with calcium and all this. But if that keeps happening, so for example, if LSD is around and we know that LSD binds to the 5 he 2 e receptor for a long time and causes a lot of activation, yep. the cell, you know, as part of its sort of negative feedback loops and regulation and homeostasis, if that receptor is activated a lot and that G protein is activated and activated and activated, this other thing comes in called arrestin, which is named for the fact that it kind of uh, it kind turns of does the opposite and turns it off. Yep, yep. exactly. And there, there are a whole bunch of interesting things which I think are, are not particularly well known. Like we know they get internalized, but is there additional signaling that's occurring once it's internalized? Like these are all questions that need to be to be answered. Uh, yeah. I see. So is it fair to say, or does uh, is, does our knowledge um, currently sort of view this as any agonist, any activator of the 5-HG2A receptor is going to engage the internal G protein structures and these other things? Or are there drugs that can selectively engage specific pathways inside the cell? Yeah. So um, that's kind of the whole um, premise of our DARPA grant is to figure out how we can selectively design drugs to stabilize one signaling pathway over another signaling pathway. Um, so we could potentially start to target, you know, different therapeutic effects, get rid of various side effects, or in this case, can we, the question we're trying to ask is, can we get rid of hallucinations by this? Um, so yeah, so it, this all comes down to the idea of uh, uh, potency and efficacy. Um, so how well does this drug stabilize the active state given for like a GQ or how low does this drug stabilize the active state for uh, the arrestin type of, of pathway and signaling pathway? Um, so what you can think about is, you know, some drugs are much more potent, meaning you need a very little bit for them to fully activate the receptor. If you think of like a, a dose response S curve, um, so where you, as you increase in concentration, the activation of the receptor goes up and at some point, point you reach a plateau um, and the efficacy of that is how well that actually activates it compared and we always kind of compare it to the endogenous ligand in this case um, so you can compare it to like serotonin where we would set that as something like you could say a hundred percent and we'll say like LSD is like 60 to 70 percent of that while being very potent but it only activates the receptor 60 or 70 percent as much as like the native endogenous ligand serotonin would. And these are all different for different pathways and different drugs. Mm -hmm. Well, so let's, let's, so, so there's an idea here, which is very interesting. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to try and summarize it for people 
um, as I understand it, and then you can comment on that, and then and then we'll sort of dig into this a little bit more. So the idea is, okay, we've said that you've got these receptors, 5-HG2A receptors, serotonin and other drugs bind to them, but there's different sort of information pathways that can get turned on inside of the cell, depending on all of the gory details here. Um, yep. Is the idea, or are there examples where you, so, so let's take the G protein example, the sort of canonical stuff uh, that we think about happening inside the cell when a GPCR like, like serotonin 2A receptor is activated or bound by a drug. And then you mentioned this other thing called a restin, which turns it off. So my question is, are there drugs or do we think it's plausible that there are drugs that can not turn on the G protein complex part of this so much and turn on something like a restin? And if so, is that a restin complex, is it they're simply as a homeostatic thing to turn off the G protein uh, stuff that happens, or does it go on and do other things and like turn on other genes in the cell or something like that? Yeah. So, so the arresting complex, it doesn't just like necessarily turn it off. There is signaling pathways within the arresting uh, kind of activation. Um, one of the more like downstream ones that everyone talks about all the time is like ERK. Uh, that's a transcription factor um, that will go and turn on different genes and things like that. Um, and I, I do think that this needs to be kind of fleshed out further. Um, uh, you know, the G protein side is fairly easy if you think about to measure because there's a, a whole bunch of secondary measure and downstream signaling occurring. Uh, the rest in the way we measure a lot of this is uh, uh, through various fluorescent type uh, assays or BRET assays, um, which actually looks at um, uh you can think of it, it looks at uh, proximity. So the proximity assay is like, if these two proteins get together, we know that they're close to each other and then they can move on from there. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, there are, there's a ton of other stuff that the arrest and kind of signaling pathway is doing mm -hmm. um, uh, within that. Yeah. And so obviously a lot of complexity and a lot of ambiguity, inherent like sort of ambiguity here with all of this stuff yeah. and all the biochemistry, but if I turn this into like a simple cartoon, the idea is you've got one receptor that we're talking about, 5-HG2A, you've got different drugs that can bind it. And the question is, you know, if you've got three sort of different, in scare quotes, different information pathways that can light up on the inside of the cell in response to something binding to the receptor on the outside of the cell, the question is, you know, some drugs might cause all three of these information pathways to light up to some extent. And we want to know, or we're hypothesizing that perhaps, you know, labs like yours can engineer new drugs that maybe make only one of them light up. And perhaps this is a way to get a drug like a psychedelic or a psychedelic derived compound that has some therapeutic efficacy, but doesn't yep. have uh, something like a psychoactive effect. Yep. Yep. That's exactly it. Um, and I mean, there are drugs so this is it's very complicated and it's not super clear right? right like i wouldn't say that these these pathways are you know they're not necessarily set in stone yet because there are drugs that are 5-ht2 agonists 2a agonists that are non-psychedelic um now most of them are more gq biased in that sense but there is some sort of arrest in signaling still occurring so it's i don't know if it's necessarily like hey on off that's yes. our kind of hypothesis out there yeah. um but you know but, you have drugs like lyceride um which is known in humans not to be psychoactive at all um uh, two bromo lsd um so bol um which actually only differs by one atom from lsd and that's known to not be psychoactive at all either um, while it is G, GQ biased in that sense, it more favors the GQ pathway, there still is arrest and signaling occurring. So I think there is a, a specific interplay here that we may be, mm -hmm. you know, missing yeah. in so, the downstream. So roughly speaking, an idea, this, this idea is, it goes something like this. There's some drugs that we know cause hallucinations, LSD, psilocybin, and so forth. They tend to uh, engage the 5-HD2A receptor and all the other stuff such that lots of calcium gets released in the cell and these neurons become more active and there's you know, certain, certain then, you know, there's, there's certain dynamics that change in the brain because of how the activity of these neurons that are being stimulated 
uh, are changing their activity. But there's other drugs that we do know about. Um, you mentioned lys- lyceride. And yep. they engage some of these serotonin receptors. They seem to do that in a way that is uh, different, that's biased towards different types of these receptors. And would the idea be that they're turning on certain pathways in the cell, but maybe perhaps not causing uh, the same kind of change in intracellular calcium and therefore the, not the same kind of change that underlies the, the activity changes that give you psychedelic effects? Yeah, I would say that's, I mean, that's entirely possible. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's, so that's, that's sort that's of like, I mean. it's yeah. possible. Yeah, yeah. We don't know the details, but yeah. like, that's sort of the space. That's the cutting edge right there. Yep. That's kind of the cutting edge right there. Yep. Okay. Definitely. Interesting. And so what, um, I mean, everything you just said sort of got at it. Um, it's pretty obvious. I think to people, why people are going after this type of question, it would, it would be very convenient for pharmaceutical companies and for just the therapeutic side of this, it would be very convenient if you could find a drug that had the antidepressant effects and uh, the neuroplastic effects that um, seem to be related to the way psychedelics work, but didn't require you to have a psychedelic trip for several hours at a time. Um, So that's very convenient. um, And that is certainly, uh, you can see why that's a motivation. Um, Can you build the case a little bit more on just sort of the nitty gritty mechanistic side of the science here for why we think it's plausible and we, we will have some success if we go down this path. Yeah. So, um, I think I already mentioned a couple of them with Lyceride and, and BOL, how they are more GQ bias. LSD is more arrestin biased in that sense. Um, there have been studies in mice, um, where if you knock out, um, the arrestin pathway. So if you knock out beta arrestin two, um, and you give them uh, like LSD or other drugs, they will uh, head twitch. Head twitch gets attenuated. So head twitch is a matter which we can measure in mice um, psychedelic activity. Um, I think that's probably the strongest evidence that we have. Is you can start to group a lot of these drugs into, particularly like things like LSD into the more arrestin base, and then we see this head twitch attenuation, uh, when we knock out our rest in, uh, for that, um, that as well. So, that's, so I think that's probably the strongest scientific okay. case I, uh, within this is you can see this pattern kind of arise. Yeah. You're going to, you're going to have to help me think about that one. So, so we said that, so drug binds to serotonin to a receptor. Let's just, let's just talk about LSD. LSD binds to this receptor. G protein signal transduction pathway happens. Calcium, uh, calcium goes up inside the cell activity of the cell changes. And we think of that as being associated with the psychedelic effects. When that happens enough, this other thing called arrestin comes in and sort of shuts that off. And so more arrestin doing its thing, I would think would cause less intracellular calcium and less excitability of the cell. But you just said that when you knock out arrestin, you see an attenuation of psychedelic effects. That's, That's confusing to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, so, I mean, you would think that more excitability in the neurons would do that, but that's the whole idea behind this is that uh, a lot of arrestin bias compounds tend to be hallucinogenic, right? Um, so I think hallucinations in that sense may not entirely be regarded towards the actual, I mean, I don't know, the firing of the neurons, sure. Um but there is definitely, I think, something going on with the arrest and pathway for hallucinogenic effects versus the, the therapeutic effect for that. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And this is, you know, this is the cutting edge. So we really don't know what exactly yeah. is going on. Okay. So um, walk us through, like, what, uh, tell us a little bit more about what exactly uh, you're working on today. Yeah. So um, I work a lot on the the structural biology side of the uh, 5-HT2A receptor and the 5-HT2C receptors. Uh, One of the main techniques I use is called uh, cryo-EM or cryogenic electron microscopy. Um, And that allows us to resolve these uh, receptors at the molecular level. Um, So a lot of my research looks at, hey, can we get, can we actually solve the structure at the molecular level of these compounds bound to the receptors Thus, we can see the interactions uh, with these compounds at the receptor itself. And then once we know that, we can start to build up ideas. Is is there any 
mechanistic thing can we deal with at the protein level that we can then infer at the functional level, which then we can then begin to infer at the more, you know, large scale level stuff. And these, these structures are also using like iterative drug design as well. So we can be, begin to actually look at the chemistry and now we can match the chemistry of the molecules, the, the shapes of the molecules in with the protein. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about novel so that's drug, kind of my main study. Okay. Um, and then a question I have, you know, that may connect to that is when we think about designing novel drugs, there's, there's multiple strategies for doing that. To what extent, mm -hmm. you know, when, when you're making and searching for a new drug in the lab, to what extent are you sort of um, studying the biophysics and the structural biology of receptors and stuff, and then literally engineering and architecting like a molecule that then you go and make because you think, okay, if it has a, this exact shape and structure, it'll bind to the receptor in this exact way and cause X, Y, and Z to happen um, versus you sort of randomly generate permutations of some base structure and then just go in and see like which of these happens to do have the outcome that we would like. I would say it's actually probably about 50, 50. Okay. Um, so you can, you can go in and based on the new structures that we have, um, you can go in and be like, oh, look, there's, you know, a specific interaction that this drug has. It's making this hydrogen bond with the receptor itself. You know, we could change it to this analog, this analog, this analog. It would either, you know, we don't want that interaction, it will polish it, or it will make it potentially stronger. Or you could look at the structure and be like, hey, there's this empty pocket here within this space. Can we design a molecule such that it interacts with that pocket itself? And you can go to the chemist and be like, hey, we need like a really hydrophobic region here. What are some actual substituents that, that then you all can put on it? Right. So I think it's, it's definitely like a 50 50 type of deal where because you have to make sure of two things. Right. You have to make sure that um, it, it makes fits in with the structure, which kind of is on the structural biology side. But then you have to actually make sure that it can actually be physically made yeah, by the yeah. chemist, right? You can't make every molecule necessarily very easily, or, you know, you can do a lot with chemistry, but there is certain limitations within what is, uh, you know, theoretically can be made and not made. Um, so there's a lot of like back and forth within that. It's like, hey, random, it's not random analoging, but it's like analoging at this position, we know will fit in with the receptor based on the structures that we have, but we don't necessarily know the you know substituent on the molecule that we can put on it to be like oh this will exactly work mm -hmm. um so and so you know when we think about something like the biological and the mechanistic basis of the hallucinogenic effects of psychedelics we're, we're talking about very uh interesting very dramatic phenomenology and that's sort of why people know about these compounds and why we start studying them and why, you know, people like you then, you know, dig in down to the molecular and even atomic level for how this stuff works. Is it possible to sort of think of things in the reverse direction? So for example, if you guys were studying LSD and psilocybin and the tryptamine psychedelics in the lab, but let's just say that like Al Albert Hoffman uh, never did his famous bicycle journey and we had no idea these things were actually psychedelic and psychoactive. Is there something about the way that these molecules are interacting with the 5-HG2A receptor that would make a molecular structural biologist like you think, huh, I wonder if these will have particularly dramatic psychoactive effects because they're doing this type of thing at a receptor rather than some other type of thing that other drugs do? Or is the, are the dots that connect the phenomenology of the psychoactive experience to the structural biology still, still too blurry? I think they're, they're still too blurry. Um, so what you exactly ha ha uh, said was kind of like um, a hope of mine <laughs> coming into the lab, um, particularly, so looking at the 5-HT2C receptor, I solved it with uh, psilocin, um, um, and that's been published already. Um, and, you know, just looking at the interactions and stuff, it doesn't look, you know, very much different than, um, you know, the proposed structures of serotonin, uh, within the actual receptor itself, and then uh, and the known structures of serotonin with other subtypes, um, and also you know the known structures that we have of 5 hc 2 a uh, with like LSD um, and lyceride. You know, it doesn't look that much different. And like thinking about that, it's like 
okay, how do we then design that around that? I still think those lines are very blurry to where you can actually get to that molecular level and be like, ah, yes, this drug will be hallucinogenic. This drug won't be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, another clear to me example of this would be glyceride and bromo LSD. If you look at bromo LSD in particular, it's exactly like LSD except for one atom, a bromine at that position, at the two position. So would you say that that's hallucinogenic or not? I don't know, right? Like, <laughs> you, yeah. but it's, it's not. So, um, and how that would interact with the structure based on the given structures of that, you know, it doesn't, the, it's not necessarily jiving quite yet. Yeah. Um, they're so, not connecting yeah. yet. So it's, yeah. it's much more, it's much more complicated. Yeah. We can't, we can't just look at the structure of a compound, know how it works with the receptor and say like, that's going to be psychoactive. That's not, but, but that is something yeah. that we aspire to. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and like I said, that was kind of like my initial hope coming into the lab is because you would think that would be the case, right? There should mm -hmm. be something structurally different because so the whole idea behind structure biology is structure begets function, right? So there should be some information within the structure then that could uh, lead us to the ideas about the function of that. And uh, you would think there'd be some sort of novel interactions that psychedelic would specifically make, but I, I don't think that that's the case and how it's playing out. It's more complicated, unfortunately. I see. And so you mentioned that most of the classic psychedel psychedel classical psychedelics, and that, that term is basically defined with respect to their ability to drive hallucinations in a 5-HG2A dependent manner. Yep. Um, yep, but yep. as you mentioned, most of these drugs bind to other receptors to some extent, other serotonin receptors, other types of receptors yep. um, entirely. LSD is an example. Psilocybin is an example. I mean, basically all of them bind to something other than just 5-HG2A. We know that if you give these drugs and you block the 5-HG2A receptor by using another drug, or you just get rid of that receptor, that the hallucinogenic effects seem to mostly or entirely go away. So something very important about 5-HG2A activation has to do with the hallucinogenic effects. Are there any drugs that are selective activators of 5-HG2A? And if so, what do those look like? Um, I would say the most, the most potent one off the top of my head is like 25-CN EMBO or uh, yeah, EMBO is what they call it. Um, that's extremely potent at 2A. It's probably the most selective at 2A. Um, but I still believe it, it activates 2B and 2C. I would have to go and check in the literature. My, I don't quite remember off the top of my head. Um, but I think that would be the most potent one. And that one tends to be, um, I think, a rough one with a lot of uh, um, you know, adverse events that had happened. It's pretty, I think, popular in Europe for I a see. while. Um, but, so it is, it is hallucinogenic, kind of but the psychoactivity does differ in some, at least some in some way. coarse grain yeah, so, way. Yep. Yep. And, um, um, I think there were a lot of cardiac events that happened with that, with that drug as well. Um, which would be indication of like, you know, 5-HT2B uh, receptor activation. Uh, mm. in it. What, why is that? Um, why, why do you, why do you bring that up? So, so, um, 5-HT2B is, is an interesting uh, kind of off target um, that uh, will occur. So 5-HT2B and 2A are closely related. They're obviously within the same type of serotonin family. Um, it's known that chronic activation of the 5-HT2B receptor uh, leads to uh, 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 valvular cardiopathy. Um, so this was actually kind of famously played out with uh, – Fenfen, the diet drug that was back in the day. Um, and that actually got removed by, you know, the FDA with that. And that was because direct um, uh, activation uh, of 5-HT2B receptor. Um, and that could be at play with a lot of these psychedelic compounds. I see. That people, if you're, if you're taking these a lot, like then if you think of a sense of maybe microdosing yeah. like, on, you know, daily or however weekly basis, whatever the protocol is, um, you know, that could be a side effect that plays out in the long term of these and people so, should probably be aware about. But that is kind of like an off target that you kind of want to design for yeah. from the drug perspective, drug design perspective, you want to design a way from 5 hg 2 b activation. To be. And yes, so with that, yeah. with that diet drug that got pulled from the market, my guess, you know, I've, I really know nothing about it, but my guess would be that, you know, 5 hg 2 b activation was not its sort of 
therapeutic mecha- mechanism of action that had been studied. No, and, it, was, it was a side effect. Yeah. Yeah. It was actually, so, I think it was a metabolite. Okay. And, yeah. and was that a pill that people were taking daily or weekly or regularly at least? Oh yeah. Yeah. People, okay. it was a really popular drug, the fen-fen, um combination. Um, okay. Um, it's fenfluramine and something else. Um, but yeah, they were, it was a very popular thing. I think it was in the nineties. I see. Um, that kind of came to fruition in the okay. early 2000s, I think. It's- so the, the cautionary, cautionary note here slash potential buzzkill for people that are, um, enthusiasts for microdosing on a daily or weekly basis would be that it would the ex so if the same thing was true with these psychedelics that also additionally bind to the 5 he 2 b receptor that yep. if you're taking them daily or weekly on some regular cadence that eventually it will cause heart issue uh, heart issues good yeah definitely okay. it's so i think in, with the femfen it was in about 30 percent of the cases yeah, somewhere and, around there. But it wasn't like they were taking so, this diet drug and on day one they had heart issues. Did it did it take no, time to manifest? No, no. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it was it was over a period of time, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, no, people have brought that up multiple times. And, you know, it is um it is related to this interesting question I think of how much of the effects of psychedelics, the you know, uh, the, the the psychoactive effects, the therapeutic effects, how much of them are coming from 5-HG2A receptor activation itself, and how much of them are coming from other receptor interactions? Do we do we know about any other interesting reactions that that you know have effects that have been worked out at all when it comes to LSD or psilocybin or anything? Uh, do you do you mean like with other receptors? Yes, or do you yes, mean- with other receptors. Yeah. So, I mean, the polypharmacology, I think, still really needs to be played out. There is, I think, one paper that was done just on binding, where they looked at a lot of the GPC, different GPCRs with various psychedelics in that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's something our lab is actively working on, kind of packaging up the polypharmacology of a lot of these different drugs um, um, of them all. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, it's... It's an active uh, part of the investigation of our lab. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I want to ask about too that maybe ties some of the molecular details you were walking us through earlier with some interesting phenomenological differences between some of the tryptamine psychedelics is this. So we talked about the 5 he 2 a receptor as a GPCR, there's G protein pathway hooked up to it. There's this arrestin pathway that's involved in sort of um, regulating that. Um, we've got different types of tryptamine psychedelics in terms of the intensity and duration of their effects. So on one end of the spectrum, mm-hmm. we've got something like LSD, which we know has last, it's the LSD experience lasts for several hours, um, four, six, eight, even, even more hours at a time. And that's because it sort of sits at, in the receptor and sticks to it for a very long time. Um, psilocybin, not quite as much, but still you're, you're tripping for hours at a time if you're taking a, a large enough dose. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got something like DMT, where the experience is really just on the scale of minutes, um, tens of minutes, say. And there's another difference that seems to relate to those which is how tolerance builds up and goes away. So, you know, most people who've done something like LSD or psilocybin with any regularity will know that if you take a dose on day one, you're going to have to take a lot more on day two to get the same effect. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you want the same effect at the same dose, you got to wait some time. And the idea there is that neurons and other cells are homeostatically regulated. So if you activate a receptor for a long time, then the cell goes, okay, there's like a lot of stuff happening there. Let's pull away those receptors to counterbalance that. And then eventually if that drug goes away or that activator, then things will go back to the way they were before. So in the case of something like LSD, which is short acting, because it's short acting, it doesn't trigger that sort of homeostatic uh, internalization of receptors, and you know you can you can do DMT multiple times in a row and still get the effects. Is that to do with the arrestin protein pathway that you talked about, where if you're just not activating that receptor long enough, that never kicks in, and therefore the the internalization doesn't occur as much. Yeah, yep. yep. I would think that that would be a plausible explanation for it. Uh, whether that's you know. I don't think that that's actually been seen in the, that's actually been quantified in the literature. I yeah. see. But to me, it seems like a, a plausible uh, explanation. Um, so, and that all does play down to the interactions, the atomic level interactions with the receptor. Um, so LSD has this strong hydrophobic interaction 
on something we call uh, ECL2 lid. There's one amino acid on there. Uh, it's L229, leucine229, which is a very, you can think of as a very carbon rich amino acid, uh, which means it's very hydrophobic. It wants to get away from water. Um, and LSD has this area on it where it's also quite hydrophobic as well. So this interaction actually causes this lid to kind of fold, to be on top of the receptor and it makes direct interaction with the LSD. Now, when you change this, this uh, amino acid here, you actually change the, the kinetics of LSD, both the on and the off kinetics from the receptor. So that leads to the direct evidence there as to why it's so long lasting uh, uh, for it. Cause it just sits on the receptor for a long time. Um, based on my 5-HT2C structure, I think something else may be going on, but um, we haven't necessarily done the kinetics data to, to actually dig into that um, at this time yet. Uh, but yeah, my guess would be DMT is different than itself too, and it doesn't interact with the same type of residue. That lid actually doesn't form, come on, and the kinetics are faster. The on rate and off rate from the receptor is much faster. I see. Interesting. So you mentioned before a little bit how you got into the stuff and went in this direction was it was it literally was was the principal reason you got excited about this stuff and wanted to understand it scientifically shulgin's book yes yeah so i, I started reading uh, uh pcal and i was like oh wow this is really cool um um you know the idea of designing new drugs that can change consciousness that way uh was something truly fascinating for me um, and then as a structural biologist, so you can think of, so as a structural biologist, there's kind of been in the GPCR realm, there's kind of been two phases of things that have occurred. So initially they were almost impossible to get structures of. You had to do crystallization of these receptors. Um, and for people, uh, I guess, not too informed about X-ray crystallography, um, you need a lot of protein for this to to happen. And you're literally... Uh, concentrating your protein and putting it in a solution such that it forms an ordered array and actually forms a crystal uh, of it. And then you would take that to a synchrotron and shoot like high powered x-rays at it. And from there you get a diffraction pattern. You can actually calculate back the atomic positions or the electron density of the protein uh, for that. Now it turns out membrane proteins are extremely hard to crystallize, right? Um, they're hard to isolate in an, in and of itself, but then they're hard to crystallize as well. So there are a handful of crystal structures out there, um, which is why it's such a big deal when a lot of these first structure papers start to come out of the crystal structures uh, 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 for all of these different different types of GPCRs. So the structural biologist, I wasn't necessarily, I knew it was a very hard thing to do. Um, then there was the kind of cryo-EM rev revolution that occurred um, where both computational power and detector power kind of caught up. And now to solve these structures, we just need to be able to isolate them. Um, so that's very different than trying to get enough protein to crystallize it. Um, and we can start to create these protein complexes and start to you know, play a lot more uh, in the cryo-EM space and actually then go ahead and solve these structures. Um, so it's become much easier. And that's why you've kind of seen, I'm sure, like the explosion of structures out there within the whole GPCR space. Um, so I feel kind of lucky I was kind of came in with the right interest back in the day from my undergrad degree and then the right time, um, you know, in terms of where with the, the tech was at. Revolution. Yeah. 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 Interesting. So how did you stumble into Shulgin's book in the first place? Um, my, my roommate actually had a copy of it and I said, Oh, what's that? Cause I had a weird name. It's PCAL, right? I'm yeah. like, what does that even mean? Um, and then that's when I started to like, look at it. And, you know, it was my first kind of, I was taking, I think I was taking like basic chemistry too at the time in my undergrad classes. So I knew, you know, a little bit about this, but then I was like, oh, wow, like he's changing molecules in these small ways and synthesizing these molecules and they have these different effects. Like, what does that mean? Um, of course, it's all packaged up in a nice, you know, cool story uh, mm -hmm. within that. And then all the synthesis and his notes in the back of the actual durations, the amount, um, you know, super interesting to me yeah. at the time. Well, so it's kind of always in the back of my head. It's like, oh, I would like to study that. That'd be really cool to yeah. do. Describe for people who don't know a little bit more the structure of that book, because it is a very unique book in terms of uh, how it's structured. Yeah. So the first half of it is kind of like an autobiographical uh, story of him and his wife, Anne's life. 
Um, so there's a whole bunch of stories of him and him and Anne and the group um, going and, uh, you know, testing out different psychedelics, their subjective experiences, um, and then various other stories of, you know, his life. And the second half is just all of these compounds and then the synthesis of them. And then his notes at different dosages uh, uh, for these different compounds. Um, so kind of if you're working in this space, you know, PCAL and TCAL, the second book that he did, which is of tryptamines, um, you know, there's a lot of, it's, it's kind of a goldmine. There's a lot in there for it. Yeah, no, they're really interesting books. If you've never read them um, or looked at them, um, you know, literally half book like autobiography and half, <laughs> half uh, chemistry cookbook, basically. Yeah. Um, so what, uh, so what other projects in the lab are going on just to get, not necessarily that you're working on directly, but just to give people sort of, uh, an idea of all of the sort of related things that, you know, Brian and other people are, are working on today at, at this sort of cutting edge of, of where you guys are. So our lab pretty much works on everything that has to do with GPCRs. <laughs> um, so we work on a lot of, uh, what they call orphan receptors. So these are GPCRs with uh, no known um, like native biological ligand or no known like probe ligand even. So we don't even know how they're activated, what their signaling properties are. They're, you can think of it, if you think of like dark matter, they're dark GPCRs, right? I like see. we don't know a whole lot about them. We know that they're there, but we don't know what they do and we don't have any way to probe their, their function. Um, so that's kind of one section of our lab that we work a lot on um, and with the uh, the IDG, which is illuminating the druggable genome. Um, so that's a lot of people kind of work on that within our lab. Um, we work on most of we have people working on most of the different serotonin receptors um, besides just the 5-HT2A receptor. I work on the 5-HT2C receptor as well. Um, and then uh, we actually, I'm co-first off on a paper recently on dreads um, where me and um, the other co-first author, uh, Shi Shang, um, him and I, um, Shi Shang actually solved the structures of uh, dreads. And uh, we kind of did, you know, I did some MD simulations and we looked at, you know, what actually makes a dread a dread. <laughs> like why? Why does it not recognize the native ligand, but we, you know, you can activate it with these certain chemical moieties. Um, so that was a really great project and fun paper to work on uh, as well. So what, um, so what's interesting. Kind of Anything you can do this. Yeah. So you work on 5-HT2C. Um, what's interesting about that one? Yeah. So that's a really interesting receptor. So being related to the 5-HT2A receptor, it's also activated by a lot of these psychedelic drugs. Um, but something interesting that I find with this receptor, just from a basic biochemical level, and, and this is something we haven't talked about yet. Um, so GPCRs themselves, some of them, um, well, actually most of them exhibit some sort of what we call constitutive activity. So this would be spontaneous activation of the receptor and some basal level of signaling with the receptor that is independent of activation on a ligand. So you can think of, um, you know, the receptor just goes and it gets, it randomly will activate with, you know, we can call the GQ pathway or anything else. So that's called constitutive activity. Now the 5-HT2C receptor in itself, I think is super interesting in this because it has all of these different isoforms that arise from uh, uh, post-transcriptional modifications um, on the actual mRNA itself, which then arise to different protein isoforms. And these isoforms arise on the specific loop where it actually interacts with the G-alpha-Q protein. And these changes uh, in this uh, lead to changes in constitutive activity and actual signaling of the receptor itself. And there is like 24 of them. Hmm. And so, so, they're found... So just, just for people who don't know, alternative splicing is is sort of the thing at play there. You're saying that 5-HG2C comes in multiple different versions. It's a protein. And the way that works at a sort of cartoon level is you can have one gene with uh, 
a certain level of complexity to its structure such that the same gene can be used to make different versions of a protein? Yes, essentially, but it's actually not alternative splicing. Um, it's uh, A to I. So it actually changes. That? Uh, so that's um, A to I. Um, it's, um, I'm forgetting the name of the I right now. Um, it's a nucleotide and it will cause uh, the uh, the ribosome to actually read differently than an A. So it actually changes it to a G. Hmm. Um, so instead of it reading as like that, you know, that single nucleotide, or it actually changes the codon, right? Because the ribosome will read in codons for each amino acid. So it actually change the essential codon from it, which then allows a different amino acid to be recruited in the actual um, uh, making of the protein itself. Um, so it's not alternative splicing in that sense. It's, uh, I see. you know, post-transcript modification of the mRNA. I see. But but the the I guess the point is... Um the cell is able to make different versions of this protein through that mechanism. Yep. And you're saying that one thing yep. that's interesting yep. about that is uh, one of the differences between these different versions of 5-HG2C receptors is their sort of baseline level of activity. Baseline level activity and also signaling with all of the different types of molecules you can think of. So it changes baseline level activity and then activation of the receptor itself. Um, so to me, it's a super interesting uh, uh, problem. Uh, um, and uh, one of my recent papers was kind of on that, um, trying to figure out um, the mechanism behind that itself. Mm -hmm. um, 5-HTC is also very interesting. There's a recent paper that came out um, dealing with obesity, uh, where there are fair, uh, different isoforms within that or different SMP SNPs, single uh, nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, which they have found to uh, potentially be important for obesity. Um, it, what 5 c 2 c is also the target of, a, of an FDA-approved drug for weight loss, uh, Lorcasserin, um, but that actually got pulled from the market, uh, I think, a couple of years ago, in 2020 or 2019. Um, for what reason? Because of um, uh, increased incidence of cancer. Mm. Um, so, um, you know, maybe down the line, 5 c 2 c is something we may not want to hit <laughs> with psychedelics as well. I think that's may happen or not i don't know but um but but yeah where's, it's a super interesting kind of secondary target yeah where's 5-hg2c expressed in the brain and body compared to say 5-hg2a um so it's, it's expressed all over the brain as well like 5-hg2a um i think it's mostly in the brain kind of like 5-hg2a okay interesting um, well, I think there's a lot of, uh, we covered a lot of interesting stuff and there's certainly a lot of detail, uh, in this conversation for, uh, for the psychedelic nerds out there to hopefully, uh, learn a little bit more at that sort of biochemical and biophysical level about how some of the thing, these things work. Um, is there anything else, Ryan, that you want to talk about or that you want to reiterate from what we already discussed? Um, not that I can think of off the top of my head. No. All right. Well, this has been uh, fascinating. You're doing some really cool stuff. Uh, and, uh, Thanks. you know, you had a nice little, uh, they call it a snapshot that you published recently. I, I've posted that online and that's in my newsletter that basically uh, there's one cartoon graphic that you can look up. If you look up Brian's name, Ryan's name and Brian Roth, um, who we published it with. Um, and it's sort of uh, a really nice, relatively simple cartoon that sort of diagrams out all of the serotonin 2A receptor stuff that we talked about and all of the protein pathways and all of that stuff. So if you want to look at a picture of it, just look that up and, and I'll put a link to it in the episode description as well. Um, for those that don't know, uh, one of my first episodes, man, it might've been the second episode or something. I actually talked to Brian Roth, uh, mm -hmm. who, who is Ryan's advisor. And so we talked about some of this stuff, um, although obviously that was a couple of years ago, so they weren't quite as far along. So that's that's another good episode to listen to along this with, with this one. Uh, but Ryan, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, this is really fascinating stuff and, and definitely good luck with uh, the rest of your postdoc. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.